do that. So. <laughs> there you go. So, well, it's good to be with you guys, Don. Thanks for the invite. You're welcome. Uh, I, I'd love to give you just a little background on myself before I, I kind of launch in, and maybe it'll uh, give a little more context to some observations I have, and then just a, a, a short challenge from the word related to all of this. But so, um, you know, my name's Neil Davidson, and uh, Massachusetts is home. Uh, grew up in the Metro West, was born in Waltham, uh, you know, kidney garden through 12th grade in the, the Sudbury school systems, and that was back when, before Sudbury really became Sudbury, you know, where, uh, you, you know, that kind of idea, but, um, and so, and, and grew up in, in one of our Baptist churches there. Uh, my parents were charter members of what became the first Baptist church of Sudbury, originally it was called the uh, um, Calvary Chapel over in the Knobscot Corner area of Framingham, and uh, my my first memories of the property where First Baptist Sudbury is is uh, uh, was as a kid walking around on it as a preschooler. You know, just no buildings there. Just they were just looking at it. And my dad was chairman of the building committee of all three phases that they built. So uh, it was amazing. He still had hair when he when he when he died in his early 80s. And uh, so you know, uh, deep roots here. Uh, I've been married for 39 years. A little over 39 years, and I've been, and I, a month after I got married, I went on my first church staff, and that was in Texas where I was going to seminary in Fort Worth, and uh, so I've been in ministry for almost 39 years. Um, I, I served on a church staff there in Texas working with college students during my um, seminary days. Um, it was an interesting period that the first few years I was in, the first couple years I was in the church, I had a pastor that, that I could really support, respect, etc. Um, great leader. Um, here was an introvert trying to lead a church of seven or 800. It was an interesting process to watch all that and the way he handled things and he led. Learned a lot from him. Then the, he, he went on to an, another church and then the other guy came and I learned how to be a team player when you don't support everything that's going on. Uh, it, was, it was like night and day in terms of the way that they led. And, um, and, and that kind of idea. And so came back and uh, planted a church on the South Shore in Hanover, uh, not too far from Brockton. Uh, that's where my two boys were born. We were living in, um, in Rockland uh, in those days and uh, planted a church there that when I got there, there, was, there were a few wounded bodies from a blown up church plant. There, there had been a plant that uh, had gotten to about 80 people. They had bought some lands, and when they couldn't build on the land they had bought, and pr pretty much all the information that had been fed to the church had come from the pastor. And when that pa when that information didn't turn out to be accurate, I don't think he lied, it just didn't turn out to be accurate. He was just kind of looking at it through rose-colored glasses the whole way, because uh, it was right on the, right on the main drag in, in, uh, in Hanover. Uh, the whole thing just blew up. And I got there in May of 1987, and there was one family and one single person who were willing to try to restart. So we met in a, in a school for uh, three years and uh, eventually bought some land, built the building, and uh, then we rebuilt it after an arson fire. So that's really an interesting journey uh, to go through that. That was, that was the desert. <laughs> it really was the desert. Uh, we met in a warehouse for seven months, and man, that was painful. Yeah, it was really bad. Um, so. Just because it wasn't worth shaping it for our needs while we're waiting for our building to rebuild, be mm -hmm. rebuilt. But shortly after we got back into the building, the Lord took me to the Baptist churches in New England, and I went on staff there, uh, serving uh, churches in the area. Pretty much, if it wasn't didn't have to do with evangelism or church planting, it was my responsibility. So that ran from discipleship right through church architecture and music and the whole nine yards, and. Uh, I was full-time on that staff for eight years and then served another ten years um, in, uh, uh, ten years? Yeah, just about ten years, uh, at, at just doing one day a week pastoral leadership stuff for them. Um, we, my wife and I, we moved our, our family to Sterling when I came to, North, to work in Northborough. We bought our home in 1994, and uh, there is a little Baptist church in town called Sterling Baptist. It was a part of our network, and it had been there since the early 70s. Um, they, they had bought an acre of land. They had put a mobile chapel on it, and, which you should think trailer. Um, that's what 
times with, they used to use that as a church planting strategy. You, you stick it in the parking lot of a Hannaford's for six months and you get a core of 30 or 40 people together and then you'd go, go somewhere else and they'd move it, move it on. Well, when they stopped using those, they took it and put it on the property. And the sad part was over 30 years they never outgrew it. Uh, they never, never ran more than 20. And uh, they were down to like four people, no pastor. And to their credit, and th though there was some working with them, they really just reached the conclusion that um, that they weren't they weren't reaching their own Jerusalem. They, they're, out of the four of them, there was only one who lived in Sterling, and the rest of them lived somewhere else. So they actually approached my wife and I and said, "Would you, would you, we'll give you the property and whatever assets we have. Would you guys start a new church in, in our place?" And, it took us a few months to get there spiritually. We, BC needed to have an exec then. Uh, it was before Jim Weidman came. I, I don't know how you've been, how long you've been hanging around, Don. But, I knew Jim. So I was the interim Jim. exec there, and I was the interim at the church in Hudson. Uh, that was a big Grace Baptist. They did, their founding pastor had left, and I was doing that pastoral role while, while, until they found the next guy. And, and so I was just exhausted. Mm. You know, so it, it, but we turned the corner, and... Um, in early 2002, we agreed to, to, to do it. We just felt led to do it. And um, so originally, I was just doing it um, part-time. It was kind of like a, a weekend thing. Uh, and we launched our first service in April of 2002. And uh, met in a school for four years. Um, God did some really neat things, and we ended up buying 26 acres right in Sterling. Uh, and we built a, a, a building. Uh, and moved in in February of 06. I was telling these guys when we moved in, and we had, the overall project was two and a half million, and we it, we had 50 percent equity, but we still owed 1.3 million. And uh, fortunately, we've got that all paid off now, which is our, a real blessing. And uh, so I've been at Hope since 2002. Uh, went full time in 2003, and uh, it's really been a it's really been a um, a great journey. We've seen a lot of neat stuff happen. Um, you know, Sterling is one of those interesting towns. You, you know, you go out there. We, we don't, outside of maybe the three ice cream bars that we have between Rhoda Springs, Sterling Ice Cream Bar, and Miola's, and Davis Farmland, nobody goes to Sterling for anything. We don't have a grocery store. We have one traffic light. We have one Dunkin' Donuts. And we didn't even have that until like 10 years ago. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, no, it's not like anybody heads to Sterling to go to Home Depot. Or whatever, but somehow we we managed to reach. We have people coming from 25 different communities, so really pretty pretty amazing and and, <coughs> and, a, and a lot of great stuff and and just regular things and and so you know given that context, so I I, I pastored two church, started two churches, and one kind of grew up to 100 125 ish, maybe a little bit more than that, and the one I pastor now we we run about 400 on Sunday mornings, so it's a pretty healthy church. Praise the Lord for that. And and then I had a decade in there or more at looking at the church from a white perspective. And um, and to tell you the truth, you know, one of the concerns I have and what I want to talk to you guys about today out of Philippians is um, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm going to tag tag off of your church name. I, I'm, I'm really kind of concerned, uh, I, I, think, I think validly concerned about the legacy that we're leaving, and specifically in the area of discipleship. You know, um, you, you, you can read in some of Paul where it's writing, we don't have to go here in Timothy, you know, he instructs Timothy, he says, take what I've entrusted to you, entrust it to others, that they may entrust it to others also. And so you see four generations there. Paul, Timothy, the ones that Timothy invests in, and the ones that the others also that follow after that. And, and when I look at what's going on in the church, and when I look at, look at what's going on in terms of the church's impact on our world, even our nation, even our communities, I, I don't think the evidence is very good that we're doing that well. You know, and I mean, you know, it, We've grown a church from a few folks. You know, if there were only four or five of us who were ready to commit to, to start the church, but we still have many people who sit in our pews that, you know, they they're they're really not embracing what does it mean to be a disciple. And 
and we, we see the evidence, right? I mean, not only is church attendance declining. Here in New England, we have, my wife grew up, part of her, her journey, she was in Newton Corner. And the two, the two buildings that were closest to where she lived, I mean, they converted them either to law offices or condos or pot shops or whatever. You know? <laughs> I mean, so you, you went, well, wow, that's a magnificent stone church building. The spire sticks, you know, 90 feet in the air, 100 feet in the air, and inside is, is a couple of law offices and a dentist's office. You know, it's just kind of, and we see that happening all the time. It's one of the reasons why you guys are doing what you're doing here, right? You just needed to, to revitalize. And, and so, I, you know, and then when you, look at this, when you look at the statistics of how church grower, churchgoers um, live, it's statistically not a whole lot different than the world. I mean, a divorce rate, all that kind of stuff, is all, 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 almost exa exactly the same. And, and I think one of the things that stands out to me is that I, I think we've, we so often today we interpret discipleship just to be a learner instead of to be a follower. You know, the original terminology to be a disciple was to be a follower. You know, Jesus called the disciples to follow me, right? And they they get Matthew gave up his tax office, you know, J Peter, James, and John gave up their fishing businesses, etc. You know, and and these guys followed after Jesus, and that was the model. That's how you learned in those days. You know, um, same with the apprenticeship thing. You'd find somebody who was willing to, to teach you a trade, and you went and lived with them for, you know, three years, five years, ten years, whatever it took, and, and it was to follow. We've reduced it a lot more just to being a learner. You know, if we can, if we can say the books of the Bible, you know, if we can memorize some scripture, we can roughly articulate some doctrines or whatever, then, you know, we, we consider ourselves to be a disciple. And, and, and a lot of what we do in, in church life is designed to just transfer information from one mind to another rather than transfer of one life to another. And so, um, so I, I, I've been, we've been thinking about like, just a lot of Hope Chapel and trying to do some different things and, you know, we don't have all the answers and I tell our people too. I said, you know, we, you know, I have pride. I only want to steal from the best. So we're not trying to make it all up by ourselves because there's other people who've done some of this stuff before. But if you happen to have a Bible, I'm gonna I'm gonna use some thoughts out of Philippians chapter one, and I'm gonna look at verses three through eleven, and uh, I want to focus primarily on verses nine through eleven, um, and uh, but I want to set up some context uh, earlier in in, in the. In the um, in, in, in these verses, and then, and, and, I, and I won't take too long. So, what time do you guys usually end? We have till 11. Usually. 11. Yeah. Well, I'm, so, I'm so, so the, guy, the guys will usually discuss what's been. Perfect. So, just refresh your memories, okay? Paul's encounter in planting the church in Philippi is found in Acts chapter 16. You know, the whole Macedonian call, for those of you who remember. That story, you know, he has this dream and he has this vision of a guy from Macedonia calling him over. A lot of us think it's Luke. And, and so he crosses from Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, into Europe for the very first time. And he travels up and he plants um, a church in the leading city, Roman city, um, in, in the area. So it, it, they would have functioned under Roman law, been governed by Roman citizens, even though it wasn't anywhere close to Rome. And... Uh, you may know the story. He lands up in jail because there's a riot that comes from the fact that he cast out a demon that was in a young girl that was making her owners, or she was a slave girl, making her owners a lot of money. And then there's there, he and Silas are in the, the inner prison in the middle of the night, and there's the earthquake, and the doors fly open, the chains come off, the Philippian jailer's ready to take his own life because he'd rather take his own life than suffer at the hands of the Romans. And... Paul tells him not to, and he shares the gospel and all that kind of stuff. And, and then he forces the Philippian uh, leaders, the city of the city leaders, to come down there and personally escort him out of jail because he's a Roman citizen. And what they did was illegal, and they could be in a lot of trouble. And he's really fighting for the reputation of the gospel there. So this is the same church. And Paul, it, it's actually the church that Paul, Paul hadn't spent a whole lot of time with them, but it was also the church that he had the least rocky relationship with. That, that we, from what we can tell in the book, they didn't have any of the, they didn't have any of the major flaws that some of the other churches did. Like 
the church in Corinth and some others that are really problematic churches, right, problem childs. So he's writing to them, and, and they just met his need. He's in prison in Rome, and chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day, and he is dependent upon others to provide for his needs while he's awaiting his trial before the emperor. And they just sent a gift by the, by the, the hand of a guy by the name of Epaphroditus. And, um, and so and he's getting ready to send Epaphroditus back for a number of reasons. And so he's writing to them, and, and this is how he starts in verse 3. He says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you, in my every prayer, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this. Hear this verse. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart. And you are all partners with me in grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and establishment of the gospel. For God is my witness, how dip deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment so that you can approve the things that are superior, so that you may be found... Um, so, and can be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now, I really want to focus on verses 9 to 11 here, but let, let, me, let me point out a couple things up front. Um, Paul loves these people. I mean, it, when, when he's offering these words, he's really like speaking to family. You know, he, he's, he's not... He's not, you know, he's not trying to be mean. He's not like he doesn't like them. He's not trying to. He, he's speaking out of a heart. He said, "I got you in my heart, and I have every other. I have every reason to have you in my heart, right? You guys have been my partners, your family. So what? What he's sharing with them is is out of a heart that he wants what's best for them. He's not trying to sell them anything. He's not trying to talk them anything. Whatever. He, he's uh, he's looking at them and said, I, "I don't want you to miss out on one ounce of opportunity that God has given." And, and, and he knows that opportunity can be fulfilled. He has a confidence because he says, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely sure of this, that the God who started the work of salvation in you can complete it. You know, he, he, he can move you from being a newborn sanctified believer to a mature sanctified believer, and he can take you that whole journey. And he said, so this is why, this is, so given those two things, this is how I pray for you, right? That your love will keep on growing in knowledge, in every kind of discernment. So you can be pure and blameless, you know, in the day of Jesus Christ. And, you know, and, and that you can be filled with the fruit of righteousness that only comes through Jesus Christ. And so, um, I love this phrase, and, and I've been, this way that he uses, says that you can approve the things that are superior. I think to be a disciple means to be somebody who can approve the things that are superior. And, and the word approve there, it, it's not like, you know, all, right, all in favor of this motion, I approve, right, you're ready. That's, that's not, what it, that's not the, the gist of this at all. You know, the gist is, is it, it's, it's twofold. It, it's really threefold. One is, you know what's superior. Right? You, you know what's superior. The second is that you desire what is superior. You actually want it. And lastly, you actually choose it. And, and, if, and, and this comes out in, in verse 13 of, it, of chapter 2. For the, you know, he, he says, Literally, For God, for it is God who is working in you. And what is God's work doing? He says, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. So when he says, my prayer is that you will approve the things that are superior. It's not that you will, you, you'll not only know them, but that you'll actually desire them, and then you'll actually choose them. So it's not just being a learner, knowing, 
but it's actually taking that knowledge and to say, now, now that I know what's better than worse, I'm going to choose the better, and, and that's gonna, what I want to want, and that's what I'm going to do, and, and follow after that. And, and the superior things is, you know, that's a, it's a very rich kind of imagery. I, I, the way I'd look at it is say, Paul's saying, these are the things that matter related to the kingdom in this world and in the world to come. Doesn't matter what circumstances or anything else. These are the things that always matter, right? The things that are, and, and I would use, you know, as a preacher, and I don't do this very well, but let me give you three F's, right? It's faith, faithfulness, and fellowship. Those, those three things are always superior, right? To have faith in God, to be faithful to God, and, and faithful when I walk with him, and to do it in fellowship with other believers, to be a part of the body of Christ. Those things are always superior, right? And, and you can chase that out in lots of different ways. But the, the thing I think that we don't, we don't appreciate enough, and, and we, need to, we need to emphasize in the life of the church more, is that the only way this happens is if we're going to change. You know, this, you know I, I, sometimes I think some of the people who come to Hope Chapel... They show up because they say, you know, I, I've got this plan for my life, and I want God to bless it. Rather than, you know, and, and so when they show up, they're really not, they're, they're not really open to change. They just go, want God to give them peace about what they've already chosen. And those aren't the same thing at all. You, you know what I mean? And so, you know, you look at this passage of Scripture, and there's a couple things that stand out to me, and I could go on all day, and I won't do that. But, you know, the first, it, 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 you know, he, he says, I want your love to be growing. And when I think about that, that means he's really saying we need to have a change of heart. Mm -hmm. We need to have a change of heart. And when, when you know, the, the heart is, is mentioned like over a thousand times in the Bible. It's just, and so it's this massive spiritual organ, right? We're, obviously, we're not talking about our physical hearts, right? But it's this massive physical or, organ. But, but I think what he's talking about here is, is he... he he wants our love to be growing, and, and, and love might there might be directed through the two great commandments, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. But what he's really talking about, he said, our, when, he's, when he's talking about that love or talking about changing our hearts, he's talking about actually going through a journey where we, we come to a place where we begin to desire what God wants. You know, and this is very fundamental way that, you know, it... You and I are never going to change and approve the things that are superior if we don't change what our de definition of a successful life is. Right? Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I fight the challenge all the time of, of, of making sure that I'm not defining success by the American dream. You know, which is, you know, it, 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 you know we're a rarity at Hope Chapel. I don't take any credit for it. One of these days they're going to get... Good, a good pastor, and they're really going to do some great stuff. But to go from zero to 400 is not all that common in New England. It's not even that all that common in our nation in some ways. And and yet, you know, and, and you can look at that and say, okay, there's there's a success story. That that doesn't have really anything to do with success. I mean, you can get 400 people to show up for a rally. You know, do, do you know what I mean? It's it, it's not the same thing. And so he he. We, we have to change our definition of success. We, we have to change what we value, right? And because and, and, those are the things that we may never really identify, but they affect every single choice we make every single day, how we react to every single circumstance. Those are the things that drives all that stuff. And the things that strike in me is, is that we're, what we, we, we hear this and we say, yeah, I get it, and I want to do that. But what we do is we want to add to ourselves but we don't ever really, and, 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 and th you know, and, and we, we ignore the, the, the need to put off before we put on. Or let me use a different imagery, to exhale before we inhale. Uh, you know, I was in, I, I traveled to Rwanda, uh, I've been traveling to Rwanda every year since 2010. And, and since 2011, the first year was like a vision tour, and since 2011 I've been, training a, a network of pastors over there that's grown to 75 guys and you know I, we just go and teach for a couple of weeks they've been doing marvelous things really taking care of advantage of a lot of great kingdom opportunities and things but you know what we're there for like you know two and a half weeks three weeks 
Every once in a while, you, you just, you know, they, they, they serve, these guys are just glad to get quantity. So they don't care about quality or variety when it comes to food. <laughs> so they, they serve rice, a little bit of beef, some, some cabbage, and chips, which are basically fried potatoes, so they're like oversized french fries. They serve those, them three meals a day for two full weeks. So every once in a while as Americans, we just got to go out and get something different. <laughs> so, you know, it's an evening, usually it's on a Friday night when we're heading into the weekend, and we went out to this place called Tilly Tilly, and, it's, and it, 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 I think in that time, it was the only place in the city where a restaurant had a pool. And we're sitting on, this, it was actually on a Sunday afternoon after services, we're sitting on the, on the, the balcony level of this restaurant, and it, which has no inner walls at all facing the, 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 the pool. In other words, you can just get, get, get a feel for the environment then, right, in the sense of never gets that cold or whatever. And, you know, they might have to pull back from the edges a little bit when it rains or something. And, and, and we're sitting up there, we're, we're, we're having lunch together with, with some of our Rwandan friends, and, and all of a sudden there's this commotion down by the pool. And this little girl had fallen in. You know, she, she'd probably never been around a pool before. And her parents are eating dinner with family, whatever, and she's, she's you know, running her hand through the water, she falls in. And so when we look over the rail, she's floating face down in the middle of the pool, not moving. And, and, and the commotion was s s some people finally saw her, and, you know, people, you, you, everybody sitting around is just not paying attention, right? And she falls. So they jump in and they pull her onto the shore. Now, instinctively what we want to do as believers, the way when we think about changing our hearts is we want to just start blowing air into the lungs. But the first thing they had to do was expel the water out. And, and if we're not ready to expel some things out, there's no room for any air to go in, spiritually. Right? So if we're, and, and, and I, I think this is why, you know, Paul says in, in, the, in the context of putting off and putting on, that kind of stuff, man, you need, you need to confess your sins to one another. There's a way in which we need to exhale. You know, you can go into your own discussions about what confessing to one another. But part of what we need to recognize is we're never going to have a change of heart if we don't want to get rid of some of the stuff that's already there. <coughs> Does that make any sense? And, and, and so we can't take in, it's like we're trying to blow, blow the, the breath of God, the life of God into our lungs, but there's no room there because we've already filled them up with something that's not going to give us life. They're full of water. We've got to expel that first. And so we have, we have to have a change of heart. The, the other thing is, is he talks about here is that I want your love to be growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment. And knowledge is, let me use the word, the content. Discernment is knowing how to use it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, the, you know, the, it's like the old story where you know, they, they call back the old engineer to the manufacturing plant because they couldn't get the machine to run. You know, and he comes in and he takes, a, you know, they've been working on it, doing all this stuff, and they call him in, you know, and, and, um, and uh, you know, he, he takes a quick look at it, and he grabs a hammer, and he whacks it in one place, and it starts working perfectly. And he hands him a bill for $100. And the guy said, well, what's that for? All you did was hit it once. He said, <laughs> he said, it's $1 for hitting it, $99 for knowing where to hit it. <laughs> you know, that kind of idea. We, we, we can know stuff, but we don't know how to use it. Forget it. You know, you know, and, and so he talks about knowledge in every kind of discernment. And, and I look at this and say, we have to have a change of mind. And, and here's, here, I can take that in lots of different directions, but let me focus on this. We, the, the mind, part of the role of the mind is to interpret or create reality. I mean, you know, I don't know how long you guys, if any of you were Patriots fan or how long, but the way you view the tuck, right, it really depends on how you want to see reality, right? The Raiders would still tell you that was an incomplete pass and, you know, that, you know, that kind of, or fumble and that kind of stuff, you know, or you just go to a Little League game, you know, and, and if it's a close play at second, you know, on a stolen base, one, one side's convinced they were safe, the other side's convinced they're out, and you could just... Some of you are married, right? It, I've been married 39 years. We had a great relationship with my wife. We had very few ar arguments in, in our journey, all that kind of stuff. But it does not mean that we see reality the same way. 
<laughs> you know, we can, we can, we saw situations with our kids, with our families, just a lot of different things differently, right? And and so our minds help create reality. I think God's trying to shape it where exercising faith in our lives makes sense. Give, give you an example. Biblically, does it make any sense at all for Moses to go back as an army of one and stand in front of Pharaoh and say, let my people go? Does that make any sense? You know, I mean, he meets God at the burning bush, and God says, you know what, I'm going to use you for this. I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses is thinking, all right, he's got the largest army in the world. Right? And he's got, you know, and so who are you sending to help me? You know, so he's like, nope, just you. I'll give you the words when you need them. How does that make sense? Not until you have a change of mind, right? 